everyone. Welcome to Words and Music 2020. I am the Words and Music Festival Director, Megan Holt, and it's my privilege to welcome you to four days of arts and culture celebrating New Orleans. Before we get rolling, I just wanted to give a shout out to a few sponsors. These are not all the sponsors. You'll hear about everyone for the next four days. But to get us rolling, thank you to Losi Insurance, thank you to Assurance Financial, and thank you to the New Orleans Multicultural Tourism Network, and congrats to NOMTN on celebrating 30 years of bringing multicultural events to New Orleans. So if you like words and music, if you like literature, art, photography, music, the city of New Orleans, or just the fact that we made this free on a donation basis, I would highly suggest that you check out the comments because there are ways to support us. You can click a donation link. You can click on the PayPal. You can click on text to give and text WAM20 to 44321. All the ways that you can support us, we will be so grateful, whether it's a dollar or a thousand dollars. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about why we do what we do. We have in New Orleans a 27% functional illiteracy rate among our adults. What that means is that 27% of the adults in our city have a hard time on a daily basis. Their literacy level makes their life harder. And what these proceeds from these four days of words and music do is they serve low literate adults year round through our nonprofit One Book One New Orleans, which gets books and educational materials into the hands of adult lit literacy programs and prison programs throughout Louisiana. So know that these four days that you're going to enjoy our work, fuel the mission fulfilling work year round with free community programming and literacy resources. Also, if you at any point in these four days would like to purchase a book that you see one of the authors talking about, you can visit wordsandmusic.org and the first thing you see on our homepage is not only our live stream, but also a link to our virtual bookstore hosted by Tubby and Coos Mid-City Bookshop, which will be opening their new location soon. So I am going to, without further ado, get started on our first panel for these four days, which is a conversation with Ni Osundare. This conversation is facilitated by Christopher Lewis Romaguera, who is a Cuban-American writer living here in New Orleans. He is a monthly columnist at the Plowshares blog, and he has an MFA in creative writing from UNO. He's also an incredibly talented poet. A few years ago, his poem about Miami knocked my socks off, and I've been a huge fan ever since. So without further ado, Chris, take it away. Hi, Megan. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I really appreciate being able to not only participate in Words and Music, but also to, uh, I guess, unofficially open it. Um, let's go. I can't express how uh, excited and what an honor it is for me to be able to uh, have this conversation with Dr. Osindari. Uh, me and Dr. Osindari have known each other for uh, a few years now. I uh, in a similar fashion, had my socks knocked off uh, uh, at a poem he read five, six years ago, back when we were allowed to be in bars. Um, and uh, we have struck up uh, a friendship, uh, a mentorship, um, and as well as uh, I have been his student. Um, and just in general, he's just been a, a positive presence in mine and many other people's lives. So I, uh, I can't wait and I look forward to uh, having this conversation with Dr. Osundari. Um, yeah, I'm excited and thank you all for being here. Dr. Osundari. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> uh, how are you doing today? 
ah, well, I'm okay. As this, uh, this times uh, we per permit. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, that's always a, that's a more loaded question than usual this year. But yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. And I look forward to being in the same room with you uh, sometime soon. <laughs> it is a great pleasure, Chris. So good to see you again. Yeah, same, same. I, um, I know we've talked a little bit uh, this week leading up to this uh, conversation. And one of the things that I had mentioned that I was most excited to talk to you about was that, uh, especially uh, in this current time, both uh, within this country, but also uh, across the world in so many countries with so much political strife, with so much political discourse, you yourself having had a column writing political poetry for so long and in so much of your work, both essays, plays, and poems, really um, discussing and focusing on, on uh, politics. I was curious what you thought, like the poet's role in political discourse is. Hmm. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Multi-layered question. Let me begin by uh, hmm, hazarding a few guesses about uh, where the role of uh, the poet. I would say the poet and the artist generally. And I'll be saying this from the perspective, from my perspective as a writer, as a teacher, and also uh, as an African and a citizen of the world. Because um, the function we expect from poetry, from art, differs from one place, one part of the world to another. We are born differently. We are educated differently. We grow up differently. Uh, we intrude upon the world differently. We live in a large world that is also so small. So there are differences. The functions we attribute to, Af to poetry, to art in Africa today are similar, but also significantly different from the functions attributed to them in the West particularly uh, in the West. I'm Yoruba from the Western part of Nigeria. Uh, poetry, which is uh, one of the children of art, is called Ewi. Now, uh, a poem is a poem. A work of art is an accomplished phenomenon when it is able to combine use and beauty. In other words, for the Yoruba to say this is a beautiful poem or a beautiful song, it must have something to say to begin with, and it must say it beautifully. In other words, content and form are in constant dialectical motion. They are related to each other. So when I got to school, uh, university, started reading all these big theories, and people were saying formalism, oh yeah, the form of the world and so on. Yeah, formalism, that's good. It is important for us to know how the work is done, but it is also important to know what the work really contains. Basically, uh, these are, are, the, are the back of, um, uh, of my mind when I'm writing. Now, uh, what is happening in the US today does, is, I'm feeling it, I'm seeing it as a kind of deja vu. I must tell you that I'm not surprised at all. I'm, from about four years, five years ago, I knew it went like this. Why? I spent most of my time fighting military dictatorships in the so-called third world, in the so-called banana republic. Uh, I was old enough to witness Idi Amin in Uganda and his antics demagoguery, jingoism, and so on and so forth. Such techniques don't always end well. Um, and so, so where does the poet come in? I think it was in 1983 when Nigeria was plunged into the kind of um, political circumstances that the US is in at the moment. An election had taken place 
it was discredited, and the, the country was hanging in a, in a balance. And then I felt called upon. I had sleepless nights. What are we going to do about this? Well, at that time, I was a university teacher and also a contributor to uh, newspapers. But I wanted something in poetry. And I spoke with um, the editor of one of Nigeria's uh, most important grassroots newspapers, the Tribune. And he said, uh, fine. I went back to the university. Within four or five days, I had composed uh, about eight poems about the election, what I call uh, the, the bullet through the ballot. And it was published full page. I couldn't, I couldn't have imagined the kind of responses I got from my students, from colleagues, from people outside as a whole. Now, at that time, I had been publishing the so-called esoteric journals all over the place without getting any responses at all. So as a poetry is capable of arousing this kind of uh, response. That was 1983. That was what started me on it. A poem in a newspaper every Sunday, and I'm still doing it. And the responses are equally um, uh, are equally encouraging. So this uh, this uh, this has uh, uh, been the way it's been happening. And I know that the way things are going in the U.S. today, uh, we are going through a very difficult period. Three pandemics. There is uh, the biological. Uh, pathological pandemic of uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, of COVID, coronavirus. There is a political pandemic, and then there is the child of both of them, which is economic pandemic. This is these are dangerous times. These are times that usually excite and inspire poetry, songs as well. Anywhere, uh, anywhere in the world. Um, I have written so much about uh, about this, and I have uh, a collection of poems now coming about the songs of COVID. Um, it, it is, I think, usual for this kind of thing to work. Vietnam produced its series of poems in the U.S. Uh, the war of Iraq uh, against Iraq, two thousand and three. I think there were war poems too. You know, songs and so on in the streets. Now, uh, the nineteen sixties. Um, we cannot talk about the roaring 60s without talking about the, uh, the, the fluorescence of poetry, especially of protest poetry and so on. So this is the beauty of poetry. It is at the heart of the people and it relates to what is happening in the world. No, and I think that's interesting and important thing to know is like the call that uh, the call to poetry during times of, of strife, of struggle. Um, you were saying that you were writing some poems about COVID. Like, what is your like call at the moment as far as writing is concerned? Hmm. Oh yeah, COVID. Um, I have read books uh, about the bubonic plague many centuries ago in Europe. Then the Influenza, great influenza of 1917-1918. And then the war against polio. Uh, humanity, right in the center. Here are the enemies of humanity, the unseen bacteria and viruses. And here is science as our shield. What is science asking us to do about this? And what are we doing about science? What we are witnessing with the coronavirus is really, really strange. I left Nigeria in January, got back here. So we are just going to be my last semester, you uh, know, in May, I'll be back in Nigeria or whatever. But two months after I got here, the coronavirus took over. I've not been able to move an inch since then. Our world has been upended. All kinds of strange things have been happening. Here uh, is a subject for art, for poetry, because it is so factual that it becomes fictional. So factual. Uh, it is so big 
that you don't even see it. I, 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 nobody could have imagined that our world would really be like this. Stay in your house. Don't shake hands. I don't know where last I shook hands with my friends. This is what I find most, uh, most painful. How can I see you without shaking hands and without embracing? That on seeing enemy says, between a stance between the two of us, I say, oh, you must not do that. That kind of dictator. Ah, uh, a subject for uh, subject for art, uh, no, no, no doubt. Then six feet apart or six feet under. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase I keep using uh, in this point. Six feet apart or six feet under. Estrangements, you know. Uh, and then what I find as a professional uh, and yeah, as a, a teacher, what I find most painful is the fact that I cannot see my students and my colleagues. And that my last semester at the University of uh, of uh, New Orleans actually ended up in a virtual uh, space. I am a hands-on kind of teacher. Why? I want to be able to see the students I'm teaching. I want them to be able to see me. I want to be able to say to some of them after the class, hey, you didn't smile all that much today. What's, the, what's happening? And then get us to talk. I have never forgotten my first day in the classroom in January 1952, and my last day in the classroom uh, in May 1979. And I remember all the names of my teachers. They are part of my life. You know, coronavirus has now taken over, and what we have is hide and speak. It's not, that's not teaching. You, we cannot get the full picture when we talk to people, we cannot touch. You know, the classroom is a sacred space. And this is what coronavirus has taken away from us. What we have is a virtual replacement. And the word virtual is very important because it is the antinomy of real. We need a real classroom, where we'll be able to touch each other, especially in a world where our problems are increasing as a result of uh, the creation of the selfie generation. Me, me, me. We are so estranged from one another. And where we are being ruled by uh, politicians who cannot feel, who don't know what compassion is. Now, the virtual thing we're doing all over the place here is deepening, is digging us deeper and deeper into the pit of estrangement. Human beings must be able to touch one another, must be able to talk with, not to, not at one another. What is art? If it is just something I shout to you in a distance. No, as an African writer, I know how important the audience is. The African audience is a hands-on, aggressively uh, responsive audience. You're doing it and they're doing it with you. I erase a song and they complete it with me. Seeing them inspires you. But you seeing them physically. It is the physicality, the father inspiring physicality of life, the robustness of it, or what the French would call joy de vivre. These are things that COVID has taken away. And uh, we are hoping that uh, it's temporary. I have spared some lines that I like, really talking about science, what science has done to us and what it's doing for us now. No, and I, I truly feel all of that as uh, I also... I, I did my first, my second Zoom meeting was on uh, my thesis defense, which was not <laughs> yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. I, I really was gripped by as someone who... Uh, you remember the handshake that you come, very, very warm handshake that you normally come after the thesis defense. Yeah, I, I mean, you I remember... That. Yeah, I remember the hug after our classes, uh, Dr. Yes. Like, I yes. missed that race, you know? Um, yeah. I, uh, 
No, as, as someone who before COVID used to do uh, spoken uh, word at bars, I was really gripped by what you were saying about the African audience and writing poetry and the call and response. Can you can you kind of speak at how you write in uh, thinking of and write uh, and how your writing informs call and response with your audience? Hmm. Um, one of the one of the reasons I'm obsessed. I'm tied to New Orleans forever. I must say, well, the humanity that is here and the music. Oh, and the music. In Af when I was uh, a little boy, my, my mother used to tell me, I used to follow bands all over. Where I grew up in Africa, the Yoruba land, is very much like New Orleans. People break into song and dancing on the streets at the slightest touch. Pam, 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 pam. My father was a drummer. He was a farmer, but he was also a drummer, a music, a, a song composer, and a singer. I grew up seeing different kinds of drums around me, and each drum had its own idiom. And um, the performer is nothing without the audience. You know, uh, you, there's a Yoruba proverb. Uh, the world is not there to sing with you. And then you are raising a song. You must be a foolish man. That is to say, before you play solo, make sure you have a chorus. Before you make the call, make sure that there is a response. Uh, there is a response. Because only a fool talks into the wilderness. So this is at the back of my mind each time I sit down. Right. Um, I have written uh, essays about this. What actually happens in the mind and the heart of a bilingual and a bicultural? You know, uh, uh, Yoruba poetry is deeply musical. In fact, in Yoruba, the word read does not go with the word poetry. You can't say, I'm going to read a poem. Uh, no, I'm going to chant a poem. I'm going to utter a poem. My father used to say that before writing came to the human being, the tongue of the mouth was there. <laughs> the mouth is a temple. The tongue is its priest. Yes. Uh, so when I'm writing, at least two phenomena are playing with or against each other. One, should I write this the Yoruba way or should it be the English way? Mm, I have been able to succeed to some extent in what I call the interface, the interlingual space. Yes, uh, but there are problems, uh, really. Am I original here? Not at all. I have to give uh, thanks to people like Tino Achebe. The author of Things Fall Apart, uh, Wale Shoyinka, the author of Death and the King's Sussman, and the man who has just died. In fact, I've just written a tribute for him, John Pepe Clark Bekederemo. Uh, these are the uh, early modern African poets who were able to wedge the two uh, traditions and the two languages at our disposal. Uh, how to, I cannot write like T.S. Eliot, and I have never made any attempt to do so. I appreciate him, I like his poetry, quite all right. But I have a rich poetic tradition too that is begging for me to, uh, uh, to use. It's the way, when I pick up Pablo Neruda, or uh, Oct Octavio Paz, and I'm reading, I feel so bad I don't speak Spanish. But when I hear people read the Spanish, the, 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 the music takes me away, you know. And what Pablo Neruda has been able to do with poetry, there is nothing on earth that man did not write about, from tomato to his shoestrings, from, uh, uh, from Walt Whitman to... Uh, 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 to um, to Richard Nixon, you know, the poem is the word. 
you know, and the poet and the where, uh, uh, and the poet and the, the poem live in the world. I write with an audience in mind, and most of my poems are musical. When I say this, I imagine the audience will be able to say, and I also write with musical instruments at the back of my mind. The drum is number one. Uh, then uh, for wind instruments, very, very important, uh, the guitar and, and, the, and so on, or simple and clapping, you know. The human being is musical, you know, and where will poetry be without music? Where will music be without uh, uh, without poetry? So um, the typical saying you revise in your last show of me, human beings are my place. When I look left and when I look right, when I look back and see my folk, my heart swells like, like a jubilant mountain. People are my close. So um, yes, it is a challenge. And this is why our colleagues, our critics, our scholars over here in the West have to understand where we who write from outside the West are coming from. You cannot enter a work of art without entering the world of the creator of that work. You cannot really do justice to the text without, first of all, studying the context. Most of the responses I get here are textual without being contextual. Um, by 1963, that was my third year in secondary school, I could draw the map of North America and place all the major towns, the industrial cities, rivers, and, and particularly love the sonority of lakes, which featured in my poetry uh, later on. In my little village in the western part of Nigeria, I think we were using a book by Shannon and Smith. There must be two American uh, uh, authors. I never knew I would ever come to the US. I knew the history of the United States. I knew the geography of the United States. And then when uh, uh, what Whitman came into our hands in the university, his voice was so African. You know, do I contradict myself? Yes, I contradict myself. I am many. I contain multitudes. Nothing could have been more African. I wish our politicians would learn from our poets, not all of them. I'm talking about poets like Pablo Neruda and what Whitman. Yes, our world is so similar, but small-minded people divide us. Uh, no. So this is it. I have this, I mean, the audience in my mind all the time. I write. Of course, I know I have to reach beyond my Yoruba audience, beyond my Nigerian audience, beyond my African audience. Uh, last week, uh, last month, there was uh, a readathon, huge thing across the entire world on Pablo Neruda. 50 years after the publication of, uh, um, is it a residence on Earth or something? Or from all over the world, I was one of uh, the, uh, the participants. You know, you know, what people were saying about the way this man has touched li the lives of human beings in different parts of, uh, of the world. For me, that is poetry. Um, is it Walter Hong, the scholar of orality, who said the writer's audience is fiction? It is fiction, but it is also a fact. Fiction, because you can never know who the people that are going to read you, all of them, but at least you can have some kind of uh, mind. I 100% uh, agree with that. And, and not just because you mentioned Naruda, who is my favorite. Uh, so, oh, you know, and uh, we've so talked. we have a we have a common enemy. <laughs> <laughs> if, if he's my enemy, I lose. <laughs> uh, no, and I I, I totally uh, agree with the point you were saying about you know having to write in you know having to straddle the line between writing your language and uh you know in english or writing you know for like me like when i first started writing uh some 
audiences that probably didn't read enough Naruto would be like, you know, you need to, uh, why are you putting Spanish in there? And like the trying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, trying to reach the audience the way that they would understand it. It's not that I'm putting Spanish in there, that's just mm -hmm. how I talk, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where I come from, we do go back and forth and that's how mm -hmm. you speak in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I really, yeah, like I really, like I really appreciate what you're saying about call and response and, mm -hmm. and there's something about reading Neruda in Spanish, it's just different. Uh, and talking about call and response, one of my favorite poets is Nicolas Guillen. Kusongo Kusongoro. It is amazing. I never heard about him because of the kind of colonial education we had. It was, we were at a poetry uh, gathering where somebody mentioned his name and uh, Jose Mati, and so I said, oh, we were young and very inquisitive. And I got a copy of uh, Nicolas Guillen's uh, book. Oh my God, I'm the Yoruba man from Cuba. And so the way he's able to bring the two cultures together. There is no way we can talk about Metisage and uh, 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 Santeria and all this, the coming together of cultures today without uh, really looking at uh, his uh, his poetry, song, you know the way he makes uh, makes song out of poetry, and poetry out of uh, out of out of song. Um, as I said in one of my poems, these are writers who have really convinced me that the Atlantic Ocean is just a bowl of water. <laughs> oh. And I, uh, what I love about someone like Nicholas Guillen is that, you know, we can study, and it's important to study as much the connections between Cuba and Africa and Cuba and the United States. But mm. by Guillen's poetry, we are able to also see all that study in action. And you could learn so much through reading the poem as action, almost as much as you could learn by like studying. It's almost like a fast forward course, I feel. Mm. I um earlier you said and uh forgive my Yoruba but um <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's right uh we'll talk about the pronunciation later over oh, you got it <laughs> <laughs> um but it was something that uh um for people who are coming in uh, later uh uh people are my clothes I believe is how you translated it in yes in your uh, City Without People, your poetry collection, uh, oh. Federal Floods from Katrina, which mm. really resonated with me after uh, the isolation and shelter in place was ordered. Um, can you speak a little bit about what that phrase uh, means to you and means to your poetry? Hmm. Uh, there is something about um, some aspects of Yoruba culture that actually remind me of uh, me, medieval morality plays, you know, uh, the every man kind of series. In the Yoruba cosmogony, the human being is right in the center. Actually very similar to the Renaissance spirit in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries centralizing the human person, the human being, making sure that all other things flow from there rather than the, uh, the other way around. Um, your driveway may be full of cars, your bank may be busting with money, uh, your wardrobe, maybe flowing with uh, uh, with clothes and you may be walking in golden shoes all those things are nothing if you don't have humanity all those things are nothing when you weigh them against the significance of the human being you know uh so it's a way of um, yeah, 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 um, there's a Ghanaian saying 
uh, I call gold, gold is silent. I call diamond, diamond cannot talk. I call sapphire, sapphire is deaf. It is only when I call the human being that I hear a voice on the other side. Uh, I think that these are things that have a lot for us, uh, especially when we talk about capitalism, without a, you talk here, yeah, we have money, money, money. It is human beings that make money. It is imp extremely important. So, uh, what you are depends upon the kind of human being you are, and what are the components of Yoruba um, humanism? Character and conduct come first. Reliability, dependability, uh, saying something and making sure that it, it is true. Don't lie. Don't deceive people. Compassion. You know, I say this all the time. Uh, a good artist is one who gets hungry, who becomes hungry upon meeting a, another person that is hungry. You have to go beyond sympathy. You have to actually achieve a state of empathy. I think this is really the, uh, the important, very similar to uh, what the one of my romant, romantic poets, uh, Kitts, will say about uh, the chameleonic impulse, you know, negative capability. That ability to put yourself in the position of so many people in the swap of so many persons, uh, of so many things at the same time. The ability to travel beyond yourself and take on without the, 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 the being of the other person, without supplanting that person. These, uh, now we're beginning to talk about these values in the past tense all over the world because we have centralized money. No, when the Romans said, uh, pecunia radix malorum, they were not lying. Money is the root of all evil. Yes, that's a Latin, a, a, a Latin, a Latin saying, you know, only book worship. That's what we call it in Yoruba. So putting the human being uh, right there in the center, this is it. It is human beings that build society. If they give you responsibility as a politician, take it as a responsibility. Make sure you do all you do for the benefit of. Uh, the human other of, 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 of your people. Why? Because the crown they put on your head, they can also take it away from them. Power is like a bird. It doesn't just stand on one tree. It is on one tree today. Tomorrow is on another tree. It is still feed people whose mind and eyes have been blocked by power who will say, yes, I'm king. I'm king forever. Nobody has ever been king forever. No empire has ever lasted forever. Uh, so the, the, the ability to learn, the wisdom, wisdom, perception. You don't just look at things. You make sure you see them. Not just see them, you perceive them. Then the ability to compare and the ability to handle difference without promoting difference into disadvantage. A very important aspect of Yoruba philosophy is that it's important for us to be different. You know, a common Yoruba uh, proverb is um, when all the people in a city sleep with all their necks in the same direction and in the same position, it will take only one dagger to slit all their throats. Yeah, difference is important. It is important because uh, it's the father of diversity, but it depends upon what we make of it. I, I probably mentioned this when we were in the same classroom together. Um, Americans, many of our friends here need to travel to see the world, uh, to be able to appreciate the kind of country they have. I have traveled the world. Uh, <laughs> America is too large for all the kind of things I'm I'm hearing. Uh, you go to some parts of Europe, you're wondering, within one hour, you are bored because of the monotony, because of the monochromatism. And here, 
every species of species of human being on earth is represented in the US. That is a great advantage. Difference, yes, but the management of difference. This is it. There are many countries in the world that are areas of the United States because of the diversity. Why should we allow politicians to turn this into a disadvantage for us and through demagoguery just make a terrible disadvantage of our, uh, of the of uh, a great advantage? The Yoruba have a way of holding this. The sky is wide enough for a thousand birds to fly without colliding. The sky is wide enough for a thousand birds to fly without clashing. Although before my father died, he used to add a caveat, unless some of the birds decide to be unnecessarily greedy. <laughs> so uh, th this, these are the things that are at the back of my mind, when I, not just when I write, but well, as a human being, you know, the kind of uh, person I am, every minute of the, before I go to bed or when I wake up, or, you know, uh, these were the things I was taught when I was young, that the world belongs to all of us, not just to one person. One person cannot survive in the world because loneliness kills. No, I 100% uh, I agree with, you know, I'm thinking and I'm going to be paraphrasing but I think it's Twain who says the cure for prejudice is travel, something like that. Mm, um, mm, mm, and I think mm. that's very important for a lot of our, our brothers and sisters in this country. Mm. Um, and I 100% I feel, and especially these days uh, in isolation, that uh, how loneliness can kill. And I think that's part of the issue you were talking earlier about teaching on Zoom. And I think that's part of the issue with um speaking to as opposed to being in contact and communication with um which is part of the reason i have also delved even deeper into i think poetry and into more uh empathetic arts to kind of try to hang on to that as much as i can when i can't mm. really hang on to, to people mm. Mm. um you just mentioned a demer demagoguery uh and politicians and uh I won't name names, but uh, in this time, in this country, uh, there was a quote that I keep going back to. I referenced it in a column two years ago, and it's a quote that I've stuck with me deeply from your uh, essay collection, Thread in the Loom. Oh. Um, but uh, where it goes, let me find the page. But it was talking about some threats that you were receiving, and uh, you wrote, of course, only a fool or one practically insane could have ignored such warnings or dismissed them as timid remonstrations of faint-hearted relations. Mm. Under, mm. In this world, like, mm. what is, can you kind of uh, exa extrapolate some what you meant by that and like how, how that goes with this world that we're currently in? Mm. The risks we had to take in saying no oppression. Uh, I think one of my favorite French writers, Jean Sartre, uh, Jean Paul Sartre, it was, who said it, a book of essays called uh, What is Literature, where he says, um, the importance of literature is that uh, you know, after reading a good book, uh, no, a writer should, be, should see his or her work as really putting the world in a in a position of saying, oh, I have seen this before, or something. Or that is to say, no, after reading a good book, you can never say, oh, no, 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 I have never seen this before. That is, it is important for us to inter intervene. Again, I keep going back to Africa, because at and the aesthetic parameters we derive from it depend upon the locus, the context, and the situation of the writer. Um, in Africa, where we are facing a lot of problems, not just Africa, Latin America, Asia, and so on, um, they used to call them third world countries, but it looks like 
some of the first world countries are now having the pathologies of the so-called third world countries. One of them is um, demagoguery. Two years ago, almost exactly, I was invited to deliver the inauguration uh, lecture for the governor of my state in Nigeria. It was, in, it was in October. It was a difficult time for me because I was teaching, but I had to go because he was a new governor or he was just taking over. And the one who was there before him gave us four years of real oppression, illiteracy, uh, divisiveness, and jingoism. I wrote about this in my poetry column in the newspapers. You know, uh, it stung him so much, I became a personal non grater in my own state. For four years, I couldn't go to that state freely. And my mother was still alive then. You know, it, it was, a, and eventually when she died and we had to bury her, my wife and I had to be smuggled into uh, uh, the burial site and so on. Uh, this is what I, I talk about. I know what it means when rulers misuse power. They endanger the people and the country and their future. But the lesson we've learned in Africa is for writers not to keep quiet. Um, well, as a writer, you are not the unacknowledged legislator of humankind, as uh, uh, Shelley said, but somehow uh, there are certain responsibilities that your profession or your standing in society have placed on you. As I'm here, Virtually every week, I have to write about things that are happening in Nigeria. Because people will write to you and say, so, 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 governor has said so, so, so. What do you have to say about this? It is important when one's voice has proceeded from, from beginning with a small v to an uppercase v. Um, and from what I see in other parts of the world, this kind of thing is always important. Garcia Marquez, the great novelist from, uh, from Colombia, was in this state uh, in the past, in the last 40 years of his life. Indeed. I remember an article in uh, Time that described him as the great voice of South America and that uh, uh, all the dictators tremble at the drop of his voice or something. As a writer in Africa, you are not just look, you are praised for the prettiness of your phrases and so on. But people ask you, but what is this poem saying about hungry children, despotic rulers, um, kidnappers, those who make it impossible for people to sleep at night? So you have to wrap all those things around. And I tell you, it is not pretty at all. Um, in the years of military dictatorship, because we experience all kinds of dictators, uh, this is why I say that what's happening uh, in this country, what has been happening in this country for the past four years, uh, it's not strange to me uh, at all. The benevolent one, the ruthless one, the murderous one, and the tortoise. Uh, so I ended up writing my inaugural, uh, my in, um, inauguration lecture using the theme of demagoguery. Yes, what the demagogue does to the people. Because that governor, terrible governor that we had, was stop in the middle of the marketplace and gather the people around, say, yeah, I'm for you. And we go to uh, the maize cellar, the corn cellar, and eat there and so on. Then disappear. It will steal money at night. The money that you go to uh, uh, to the people, or, or you know, for the betterment of, of their lives, he was stealing the money, and he was harassing uh, uh, op op opposition. But he was going to, you know, and uh, 
this was it, the demagogue. And that's why they are dangerous because they end up getting the people to think like them. It, it worms his way into your heart in such a way that you leave your thinking for him. So he says, do this, and lo and behold, you do it without even thinking. I think every time in the past couple of months, I have been remembering Judge Orwell, either Animal Farm or 1984. Because the first casualty in the situation of demagoguery is the truth. And the demagogue kills truth through the process of displacement. When one political operative about four years ago said, alternative reality, it hit me hard. I didn't know it was even going to play out like this. Alternative reality, that is extremely dangerous. And I think we've seen what this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of, this kind of neologism has been doing, not just to this, this country, but to the world. What bothers me is that we live in a world now where you, I, you don't know what to read. Misinformation is all, the, and this is the time we should be enjoying the fruit of the internet. The internet. I mean, can you believe what our world was like 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago? And then this magic came to us. And we have to thank the initiative and the inventiveness of many American scholars in bringing this about to unite our world, to make things better, to help the development of human minds all over the world. But the, it is so useful. You finish your message here in New Orleans and then push the button send. Prim. Within a split second, it is in Kinsagani, Kinsagani in the Congo, or it is in Havana, or it is in Melbourne, Australia, or it is somewhere there in Dubai. I mean, fantastic. But falsehood also travels that fast. And this is where the danger really lies. We, we have to be careful about the way we use the internet. My mother, bless her soul, used to say, my son, when something is too sweet, enjoy that sweetness, but please don't forget to probe its bitter part. Nothing comes alone, no. So we people of the world have to be wise. I see many people going around, they're clever, knowledgeable. They have information. Information is not the same, same thing as education. And cleverness is not the same thing as wisdom. The Yoruba have a, way for, a, a word for that, la kaye. That is, I don't have any English translation for it because it will take, take about six different words in English to translate the word la kaye. That extreme, extreme wisdom, the one that is, uh, blend, is blended with perception, with insight, and so on. This is really what we need to be able to distinguish the sharp from the grain. Um, it is not a, a, a pretty thing, but because what I've been seeing, especially since uh, the election, has made me extremely sad. People call me from Nigeria, uh, uh, Prof, what is happening? They're surprised. How can this be happening? When we have problems with our own democracy, if, if you expect America to come and uh, uh, and and, and uh, give a word, what are we going to say about what is happening there now? I think what is this is this is teaching us is that human beings are the same all over the world. Your nuclear silos. The glittering aeroplanes, the trains, and so on and so forth, these are material things created by human beings. The human soul is like the river. It flows from one continent to another, from one country to, uh, to another. Dictatorship is not restricted to just one place. If what is happening here is happening in some other country, in Latin America or Nigeria, people uh, uh, people in America will say, oh yeah, it's a banana republic. 
uh, nothing could be more banana republic than what I'm seeing here right now. You know, but I think basically this is what in America here we call a teaching moment. No system is perfect. As I say, when we are studying literary theory, every theory leaks, every constitution leaks, because every constitution in the world is aspirational and conjectural and speculative. You, you then take it as a, a Bible one, you know, this kind of, no, American constitution almost 250 years old, was put together by uh, three or four, four men. At a time, women couldn't vote. Of bl blacks were not regarded as human beings, and uh, you know. Uh, so we, the people, the first person plural we in that constitution was interpreted differently two fifty years ago or two forty something years ago from the way we interpret the thing today. I think this is an opportunity for America to take a look at its constitution. Take a look at the rather archaic method of the electoral college. Uh, you, in other parts of the world, it is simpler. Whoever has the largest number of votes is the one that becomes governor or president. Here you have it, and then you start going again, what are people here saying? If that worked in the past, it is no longer working. Uh, so, what is happening here now, and the rest of the world uh, should also learn. We need a lot of humility, yeah, to be able to look inside and really say, ah, what's happening to us? Finally, we have to be able to distinguish between nationalism and jingoism. Nationalism, healthy. You have to know how to, uh, you, if you don't love your country, you can't love yourself, and vice versa, you know. But jingoism is my country, my country, wrong or right, especially when she's wrong. That is the recipe for tragedy. The world has gone through a lot of this from 1933 in Germany to 1945. That was what, what happened. We cannot afford to go, uh, to go through it. Of course, jingoism goes with, uh, with demagoguery. You know, me, 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 me. And uh, no, this one, we, we are fine. No country in the world today can stand alone no matter how powerful. Nature has de uh, de defined it so. No, no matter how powerful you really think you are, you cannot stand alone. A lot of what we call the wealth of America is derived from other countries in the world. Suppose you produce all your cars here, and I know nobody to sell these cars to in, uh, in, in, uh, in Zambia or Nigeria or, or, uh, or Argentina. We are all bound together. Let nobody be so arrogant as to say, without me, the world cannot survive. No. So this is a teaching moment. You know, uh, and it, this, the whole world is watching. America is not a country for Americans alone. America is a country for the whole world. It is important for people to know this. Uh, I uh, couldn't agree more the country uh, America is not a country for Americans alone. In particular, I think of the Cuban phrase that my dad used to hear a lot, where it's like, you know, todos somos americanos, because we are, uh, you know, it is two continents. It is not one country. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, I would personally stay here and talk to you forever, Dr. Osendari, but I do think we are going to have to wrap up. I do want to end it because I think it works so well um, with your last response with some words you have from the same essay we had just quoted in Thread of the Loom, which is create freedom and the creative space. But you put, let the lie run for 20 years. It will take the truth only one day to overtake it. Art is that truth. The oppressor's violence and its enabling falsehoods constitute the lie. And that is a very hopeful thing I've kept in my mind. Uh, mm. in days, and mm. I appreciate you for writing it. Mm. Yes. That's again um, my debt to <laughs> Yoruba philosophy, a Yoruba proverb. Ogodun tirotinsa ojoka lubagba fu tola tileba. Let the lie run for a hundred years. It will take the truth one minute to overtake it. 
that is it. If it ain't right, it ain't right. Uh, it may look like it, but it is uh, really not. Um, and whatever you sow is what you reap. No matter how long it's going to take, or no matter how how short. Um, truth with an uppercase T. And in my own, one of my poems, that's what I call the shortest distance between two minds. That is the truth. And this is, thank you for uh, allowing us to end on this note. This is one, uh, one element. I call it phenomenon, actually, that we have to emphasize in the world we live in today. We have to re-engage with truth. We have to, to re-engage with the definition of truth. And in doing so, we must take pains to identify not only the um, antonym, that is the opposite of truth, but also the enemies of truth. Um, I wouldn't want a world, a world in which somebody will press the nuclear button based upon misinformation. This world belongs to all of us, from Yokohama to uh, whatever. We all have a stake in it. The way we are going, we have to be extremely careful. It will be too late to say, oh, I didn't know. Um, so it is important truth. We have to redefine it. What the present American situation is asking us to do is to look truth. How did we define truth four years ago? How are we defining it now? And how has the world been defined? How's, how has America been defining truth? Uh, from 1776 to 2020. And how does this uh, impact on Americans, especially on different people, the different people who live uh, in, this, in, the, um, in this country? What is the truth of the slave owner? What is the truth of the slave? And, and so on. It is complex but we have to engage it. As I said, we have to really do battle, make sure we redefine truth and go to war with the enemies of truth. No, a hundred percent. And uh, and I have hope uh, even even when it's hard, but I believe, I, I think a belief and hope in that will, uh, is going to be extremely helpful for all of us right now. Um, Dr. Osandari, thank you so much. I, I look forward to warm handshakes and warm embraces and maybe a little rum in the not so distant future. It, it is you I should thank, Chris. It is so good to see you again. Always and so if, good. And if we we'll see Ross, royalty, <laughs> tell him I say hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the beards will be reunited once again soon. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you. Um, I also want to thank Megan Holt for uh, and Words of Music for hosting this, um, and Candice uh, Huber and uh, Tubby and Coos. We do have a virtual bookshop that is in the comments in both YouTube and Facebook, and you can find on the page. And uh, we appreciate everyone for the donations um, that have happened and to come. And uh, and once again, thank you so much, Dr. Osendari, for talking to me. It is always a pleasure. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. Have a good one. Yeah. Bless it.